Although Israel may believe that it can do anything it wants, the news coming from the Red Sea, especially in recent days, shows that this is not the reality on the ground. Unmanned kamikaze drones fired by the Houthis one after another in the region, the U.S. firing back from ships in the region, the world's giant transportation companies saying that they will no longer use this route and other developments. Following these developments, coalition forces, particularly the U.S., decided to send a joint naval task force to the region. In response to this, the Houthis' statement that you will bring the end with your own hands brought the same question to all of our minds. Can the Houthis really hit U.S. or any other country's warships? Can U.S. aircraft carriers be sunk? Let's take a look at the answer to this question and the history of this issue through U.S. aircraft carriers. When we think of fierce rivalry, we immediately think of derby matches, but it is not possible to talk about a similar effect for the United States, especially when it comes to the military. The derby that Americans look forward to every year is not between two big teams, as you might think. One of the biggest rivalries there is between the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Army. Every year, the best soldiers of the U.S. Army make videos, show how ready they are for war, and at the end of the video they chant the slogan, Go Army, Beat the Navy. The Navy doesn't lag behind, releasing videos of its newest ships firing missiles and fighter jets landing on aircraft carriers. At the end of the video, all the sailors, from pilots to enlisted men, shout, Go Navy, Defeat the Army. Although it may seem like a sporting rivalry, the roots of the conflict between sailors and landlubbers are almost a hundred years old, and neither side is willing to give up its claim to be the best. We will come to the Houthi threats against US aircraft carriers. But first, let's rewind the movie a bit. When and how did the US aircraft carriers, which today fly flags all over the world in one form or another, come into existence? Now, if I tell you that an army officer saved the US Navy, you will think I am exaggerating, but indeed, if it wasn't for this army officer, maybe we wouldn't see aircraft carriers in the Navy's videos. A US without aircraft carriers wouldn't be such a deterrent, and who knows, the course of history would have changed. If you are ready, grab your tea or coffee and sit back. We are going on a tour of hundreds of years and billions of dollars together. It all started about a century ago. The US did not want to get involved in the First World War, but it did not want to remain unaware of the developments. Of course, GZT, which provided the fastest and most accurate breaking news at that time, did not yet exist. As a remedy, the U.S. sent observer officers to the regions where the war was going on. One of them was Billy Mitchell, a 38-year-old major. Mitchell was a pilot representing a very small part of the army. He soon rose to the rank of colonel for his courage and leadership. Mitchell watched the air battles on the ground and had heated discussions with many of his colleagues about how airplanes would affect future warfare. The fall of 1918 was perhaps the most important days of Mitchell's life. He planned and personally directed the attack of an Allied task force of one 500 aircraft. With these air raids, in which the Germans suffered serious losses, Mitchell suddenly shone. When he returned from the war, he was a brigadier general. His rank was not the only thing that changed. When he returned to the U.S., he brought with him not only his observations from the war zone, but also his radical ideas about the weather. In his opinion, aviation should definitely be separated from the army. For Mitchell, airplanes would completely change the history of warfare. And that meant building airplanes that could fly higher and carry more powerful bombs. With these planes, it was possible to hit the enemy's war factories. Armies without weapons and ammunition to fight would soon declare an armistice. Let's stop here briefly, and let's answer the question, why would the U.S. have such a comprehensive defense plan when it only has a land border with Canada and Mexico? Yes, it, the U.S., has land borders with two countries, but the U.S. also borders two huge oceans. It has a vast area to protect. To protect this difficult area, the U.S. Navy used warships, known to the Turkish people as battleships or dreadnoughts, each of which fired projectiles weighing hundreds of kilograms. As a result, you could go to any part of the world with these ships and burn any target within their range like hellfire. But battleships had two major weaknesses. First, they were only built to fight ships above water. It was not possible for them to fight against submarines and airplanes. The second weakness was that they were very slow compared to airplanes. Billy Mitchell shared his thoughts shaped by these realities with his fellow pilots and sailors. The backbone of the US defense should not be old battleships, but ships carrying aircraft. They would shoot down any planes that wanted to enter the United States in the air before they reached the mainland. If necessary, these aircraft carriers could deliver air power to any part of the world. They could destroy the enemy country's factories and infrastructure within hours. 
Mitchell's fellow sailors were in full agreement with his ideas, but it was not possible for them to speak them aloud or to overcome their superiors. Mitchell, on the other hand, was willing to go against convention, because he believed that the decision makers in the US Navy did not have the slightest idea about aircraft carriers. To the decision makers, the airplane was a good observation tool. Surely the US Navy had to have a strong aviation. But the idea of naval and ground forces serving in a joint air force, as Billy Mitchell wanted, did not make much sense to them. For them, instead of airplanes, the tangible idea of zeppelins made more sense. Zeppelins were transported by zeppelin ships with a huge tower on top. Mitchell wrote about his ideas in newspapers without permission from his superiors. He brought in powerful public figures. He believed he could prove his ideas in the field. Finally, he was able to convince his superiors that the Navy and the Army should conduct joint exercises. Aircraft, he claimed, could easily sink battleships. The Navy allowed old battleships to be used as targets, but there were conditions. We won't list them all. But the Navy added a lot of rules to make sure the grounders weren't right. Mitchell had no intention of following the rules. He sank them all. The Navy claimed that the grounders had cheated. The next day, the newspapers ran caricatures of the exercise called Project B. The Navy was deeply offended. From this point on, the rivalry between the Army and the Navy had turned into a war. The media, on the other hand, had no complaints about this situation. Because the most read news at that time was what was happening between the US Navy and the US ground forces. The sailors disliked Mitchell for going too far. His land superiors did not want to back him, believing that he was starting an unnecessary war. The United States was shaken by the news of a disaster, whether it was airplanes or zeppelins. The zeppelin USS Shenandoah, which was filled with helicopters and claimed to be extremely safe, and three seaplanes crashed in a storm. Fourteen sailors lost their lives in the incident. Billy Mitchell openly blamed the Navy. This was the last straw. He was court-martialed. Mitchell demanded a public trial so that he could speak his mind. His trial was reported on page after page in the newspapers. At the end of the trial, he was stripped of his ranks and expelled from the army. You think Mitchell was kicked out of the army and that was the end of it, don't you? It wasn't. The truth somehow found its way back. Aircraft carriers became one of the objects that saved lives at the most critical moments and declared U.S. hegemony to the world. Let's take a look at the technical side of things. Contrary to popular belief, the biggest problem of the aircraft carrier was not lifting giant airplanes from those short runways. Airplanes could take off from ships, but landing was a problem in itself. In the early days, the planes that took off from the ship would land at sea and be taken back to the ship with the help of a winch. During the First World War, the British Navy made countless attempts to land their planes on ships with runways. Many planes failed to stay on the runway and crashed into the sea. Many planes crashed into ships by mistake. Dozens of young men lost their lives in the prime of life. It is the most famous saying in aviation. Here, both history and rules are written in blood. The British managed to land and take off ships at the end of the war and became true pioneers. They were quietly followed by another country, Japan. Years later, Billy Mitchell's ideas began to be valued in the United States. The Navy began to build aircraft carriers, but the Japanese had already taken the lead. On December 7, 1941, the United States was struck by an enemy force from the seas. Hundreds of Japanese planes from aircraft carriers sank the battleships in Pearl Harbor Harbor. It was hell on earth. The battleships could not protect themselves, let alone the United States. U.S. aircraft carriers could not prevent the attack, but they survived. Then they moved the war to Japan's backyard and history was once again written differently over small details. Since then, the US has not hesitated to use its warships, sometimes for hot confrontation, sometimes for a show of force, and sometimes, as in the recent case of Israel, for blockade, protection and if necessary, a very strong counterattack. Let us come back to the question we asked at the beginning. Are aircraft carriers really an unsinkable war machine? Or do they also have weak points? When we answer this question from a historical perspective, two weapons stand out. The first one is the torpedo. Most of the aircraft carriers sunk in the Second World War were sunk by torpedoes fired by submarines. In addition, we should not forget the bombers that could carry torpedoes. The number of aircraft carriers damaged and ultimately sunk by torpedoes fired by them is not small. 
While there are dozens of risks for naval platforms above the water, one of the issues that every sailor knows best is the fact that it is much, much more dangerous for them under the water. Underwater was not safe for aircraft carriers in the past. It is not safe now. That is why aircraft carriers never sail alone. They need frigates and destroyers for anti-submarine warfare. They also require aircraft whose purpose is to fight submarines to be part of the task force. The U.S. Navy has four to six destroyers in a single carrier strike group. These ships are accompanied by one cruiser. There is one more insidious member of the group, invisible to the eye. Each strike group is accompanied by a nuclear-powered hunter-killer submarine. Despite all these defensive measures, a modern submarine commanded by a nervy and brave submarine captain can sink an aircraft carrier. In an exercise in 2005, a Swedish Navy submarine infiltrated the attack group of the USS Ronald Reagan, the US Navy's newest aircraft carrier, priced at $6.3 billion and managed to drop three torpedoes. I have already mentioned that there are two distinct weapons for sinking fighter planes. Now let's turn to the second weapon, aircraft bombs. Planes taking off from ships find the enemy's aircraft carrier and drop their bombs. Of course, this is not so easy. Because the carrier is protected by fighters, Bombers alone are not enough to overcome this obstacle. They are always accompanied by fighters. Today, a U.S. Navy aircraft carrier can carry 44 F-18 fighter bombers. There is one E-2 Hawkeye, the carrier's eyes in the sky. In addition, five F-18G electronic warfare aircraft are carried on the carrier to jam enemy radars and destroy enemy anti-aircraft sites. 11 helicopters and two C-2 Greyhound cargo and passenger transport aircraft are on board the carrier. When we add all this up, we see how costly it is to own an aircraft carrier and use it for missions. Historically, the killer of an aircraft carrier has been either submarines or planes taking off from other carriers. Aircraft carriers and carrier groups spend five to six months of the year at sea. While the US uses nuclear propulsion on its aircraft carriers, the other surface elements of the carrier strike group use petroleum-derived fuels. The 5,000 personnel on board an aircraft carrier need regular rest and replenishment. Regular resupply is therefore a necessity of sorts. Some of the time that aircraft carriers spend in port is spent in their homeland. In addition, visits are made to naval bases in friendly and allied countries throughout the year. Port visits are not only a political show of strength, but also an opportunity to refuel aircraft carriers. The issue of refueling at sea is a separate problem, because the elements in the task group need refueling on a regular basis. For this reason, one logistics ship always has to accompany this armada. It would not be wrong to say that these fuel-filled ships are the weakest link of the carrier strike group, but it is also impossible to separate them from the team. Because without the logistics ship, the other elements of the group can serve for a short time. Speaking of fuel, we cannot not mention the thousands of tons of aircraft fuel stored inside the hull of the aircraft carrier. When aircraft fuel is not stored properly and safety precautions are not followed, it invites accidents. The accident issue is important because the most annoying situation for aircraft carriers, which are called yuzakale, is such accidents. Aircraft carriers are built to withstand the shock of tons of explosives. But if this explosion happens inside, then everything gets complicated, because aircraft carriers carry tons of highly flammable aviation fuel. In addition, tons of ammunition containing explosives are also stocked here. The U.S. Navy suffered its biggest aircraft carrier disaster in the Vietnam War in 1967. 134 sailors were killed in the incident that almost brought the aircraft carrier USS Forrestal to the point of sinking. 161 sailors were injured. The cause of this disaster was not an advanced anti-ship missile but an electrical contrail. An electrical fault occurred in one of the FIV aircraft on deck. Because of this malfunction, the Zuni rocket loaded on board fired on its own. The rocket exploded on impact with the fuel-laden planes opposite. While firefighters were trying to extinguish the fire with all their might, the bombs loaded on the planes, most of them from the Korean War, started to heat up. The thin steel body could not withstand the heat and explosions followed one after another. All this happened in less than two minutes. The runway of the USS Forrestal aircraft carrier was completely destroyed. The ship had to return to the United States. It was repaired in the shipyard for five months. It was fortunate that the fire did not spread to the fuel and ammunition on the lower decks. The weakest point of an aircraft carrier is the tons of fuel and ammunition it carries. As we said at the beginning, an aircraft carrier is not a ship that can take off an airplane. It is a ship on which airplanes can land. No plane can land on an aircraft carrier that has lost its deck. In the Second World War, it was aircraft carriers that enabled the American Navy to overcome the Imperial Japanese Navy. Since then, aircraft carriers have been the backbone of the American Navy's defense and a pillar of power in American foreign policy.
The initial construction costs of aircraft carriers can run into tens of billions of dollars. Let's say you build the ship. To use it, you have to have deep pockets. The annual cost of an aircraft carrier battle group in 2016 is $700-$750 million. Let's open a parenthesis about how aircraft carriers will be tested outside of deep water. Due to their high draft, aircraft carriers cannot operate in shallow waters such as bays and gulfs. Shallow waters can turn into a killing field for aircraft carriers that are used to swimming in the oceans. Mines, coastal submarines, and land-based anti-ship missiles are all threats. An aircraft carrier that is not properly protected can become the most expensive target in history. So far, we have discussed how aircraft carriers emerged on the U.S. side, what kind of development they have undergone, and what consequences they can affect today. Now let's come to our question at the beginning of the video. Can the Houthis who have announced that they will target ships in the Red Sea in response to Israel's attacks on Gaza really hit U.S. warships. We don't know exactly what the Houthis are counting on when they threaten the U.S. Navy and especially aircraft carriers. Because what systems such closed structures have, their usability and the possibility of finding the target when fired have always been a matter of debate. But there is one fact. The U.S. is trying to counter the kamikaze drones fired by the Houthis which cost perhaps $2,000, with missiles with an average price of $2 million. For the time being, the United States is somehow not intercepting all the drones or kamikaze drones that the Houthis are firing, either towards themselves or towards Israel. But there is a remarkable point for the defender and the attacker. The defender has to cover everything and anything. You can liken it to a goalkeeper. You make so many saves in a match, but one goal changes everything. This is what the issue between the Houthis and the US is like. If a single one of the dozens or even hundreds of drones or kamikaze drones fired by the Houthis reaches its target, then we will be talking about completely different things. Let's also mention a small detail for those who are not familiar with the subject. Of course, it is not possible to sink giant aircraft carriers or other war platforms with a single drone or kamikaze drone. However, it is very possible to take out the system and render it incapable of performing its mission. We will see whether aircraft carriers will be able to maintain their immunity in this process, in which we are witnessing one of the most interesting periods of asymmetric warfare. Although Israel may believe that it can do anything it wants, the news coming from the Red Sea side in recent days shows that this is not the reality on the ground.